we're going to get an audio teaching today. So bear with me. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. listening. Everybody give a shout out to Mike Bickle. Yay! Thanks for the notes, Mike. <laughs> Hello from Louisiana. <laughs> so we're taking what Mike's giving us and we're running with it. We are running. Oh, baby, run. I think what we shall do today, first of all, let me just say before we pray and start the teaching, is that this is always better than where I've come. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1984, and what we did then was we all had these little paper notebooks, and we would take notes for each other as we prophesied over each other, and I, I had a friend who was, um, hold on, Joe, we got Skype on here too, so I think Joe's lost his Skype, hold on, we had friends who uh, used to be secretaries, and they would take prophecy notes and teaching notes for us in shorthand. <laughs> Oh, that was fun. God is good. All right, hold on. We got a friend on Skype from Atlanta. We got people from Dallas. We got a few friends from California and Colorado that want to join us. For the life of me. Okay, okay Joe, we're live streaming, so just listen, buddy. Okay, I at least got audio. So we used to use shorthand, and then she would type up for us. And pass out letters the next week of the prophecy. Oh, Lord, 10 years later, you should have seen me when I got my own personal little cassette recorder and my little lapel microphone, and I would put that on my belt. I felt like I had arrived in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited with my look. I'd get a bunch of blank tapes, and I'd put them in there, and I'd record prophecy and pass them out to people, and they'd go, what do I do with this? I'm like... You got to get a cassette player. <laughs> then we went to, uh, gosh, there was this great machine you could buy. It was like $700, and you could um, burn right onto a CD. Oh, my gosh, I had arrived. I burned right onto a CD. But then we had to process it. it. Between each prophecy, it took a minute to two to format the CD before I could hand it to people. <laughs> then, after that, we went to uh, digital recording on that same machine and we put it on SD cards. So if I ministered to 10 people, I had to go home, take the SD card out, put it on some computer, which was not a laptop, it was probably some desktop somewhere, figure out how to burn them all a CD, figure out how to get it all to them. Woo! Have mercy. So here we are. Woo! We were all live streaming on Facebook. Thank God for technology. One on Skype. And I've got my little phone back here behind me who's recording it. And I still love CD, so I may make some of those later. Anyway, we're figuring it out. We may be old, but we're overcoming. We're keeping up with the latest trend that God has. Next week, we may be periscoping. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whatever that is, we'll figure it out as we go. <laughs> I tell you what, though, we've spent a lot of years in the presence of God. And uh, just because we may not be exactly technologically savvy, we're the ones you want to hear from. This group of ladies in here, man, forget the technology. You know why we're late? Because I just said, I'm sick of this technology. I want to sit here and worship the Lord a little more. So we're late because we wanted to worship God. And we were worshiping to Dwayne Roberts, One Thing I Desire, which I highly recommend. All right, so let's have a little prayer. Oh, God, Bless your name. Diane, please pray for me. Oh. I mean, pray for all of us. Father, in the name of Jesus, for the shed of the on no quarter I see. We thank you, Lord, that you are God. We thank you that you are our Father. We have a shed of the on no quarter I see. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you move by your spirit, Father. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you will bless your minister, Cindy, God. Lord Jesus, let put the words in her mouth, God as a ready writer, God, that she may write, Lord Jesus, your revelation, your knowledge, your wisdom upon the heart of your people, Father. Father, as we go, Lord Jesus, deep into your word, God, we ask that you would give us a simple and a clear understanding, Father. Yes, and we give you all the praise and all the glory, God. 
We bless, Lord Jesus, those that's looking in. God, we bless those that's listening for a fresh word of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, God. Lord, bless their hearts right now, Father. Bring up your bride. Increase your bride, Father. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, for those of you who couldn't be here last week because we didn't post it on Facebook, we're on part two of probably a 30-week teaching because we believe in going deep into the Word over here. Most people were teaching 10 weeks now or less on the Song of Solomon, but I started out with the old-fashioned Mike Bickle teaching from the 90s, and I tell you what, there's nothing like meditating on the Word for a long period of time. So if any of you want some notes, they can be found on ihopkc.org. You can buy a little book. Let's see, I think they've got one called The Song of Songs, and it is a 10-week book of teaching notes. Uh, they're not exactly the notes that I'm using. I am making it up as I go from my own experience, and I'm going from Mike's old teachings, which are two big volumes. But Mike says we have the freedom to copy because he says his copyright law is we're free to copy anything he does. So I don't feel one bit guilty about it. Besides, it's been so enriching to have learned from him, and it's wonderful. So we already have this. Let's spread the word around. Just to summarize slightly, uh, the first three parts are a summary of the Song of Solomon. I know all of us are so excited to dig into the Word and start in with, you know, kiss me with the kisses of your Word, but we needed to have a little background. So last week we talked about the types of interpretations of the Song of Solomon. There's the natural interpretation, and there is the timeline interpretation, and we are looking at the allegorical interpretation which means we are looking at it personally, that it is Jesus, the bridegroom king, speaking to us, the bride of Christ, as the Shulamite. And that is how we are going to interpret it together. I think this is how we will get lots and lots of richness out of it. We have a yes in our hearts, and we are excited about God. Now, I passed out last week a handout about, I'm sorry the second page is blurred, I will recopy that later, and if you will Facebook message me, I will scan and send you a copy of these notes. We talked about praying and reading the Word of God, that this is more than just a study, this is actually getting into eating and chewing on the Word of God, and I pass out a second handout this week that's about journaling and pray reading the Word. So I'd like to review that real quick. These are just practical aids to help us get our heart right with God and ready to receive from Him. And they're actually not new. If you ever uh, have read Experiencing the Depths of Jesus Christ by Jean Guillaume, which was a saint from ooh, way back when, I think it's like the 10 hundreds, I can't remember exactly. But she's from France, and she teaches this very simple technique and was actually imprisoned for it um, and tortured slightly. So she would sit with the Bible in her lap. She would read the verse out loud, and she would meditate on it, and she would pray it. And that's one of the ways it becomes part of you, quoting the word to yourself. So let's just look at this real quick. We should actually pray the actual Bible passages back to God. And you all should have a journal or a notebook of some kind as you're going through this season of studying the Song of Solomon. That's very important because you will change. You will transition from where you are now into the deeper spiritual maturity of the mature bridal partner of God. And you want to have your notes. You know, I wrote in the margins here. These are my notes. And I also have my personal journals, my prophetic journals that I've been keeping since 1984 or 5, and I cherish them now. It's my journey. Uh, at times, you know, I don't journal every day, but I journal the most important moments. I went through seasons where I only journaled what God said because I didn't think what I said was worth hearing. It's just a bunch of whining and complaining when I read back to my journal. And then I realized, wait, this is an unrealistic view. People need to see the struggle as well as the successes of a true prophet of God. So I think it's very important that each one of us learn to journal however you choose. So one of the basic things that we're learning, there are two truths that
that we're learning through meditating. One is to believe in God and to obey him. It's very simple to say, I believe your word. I believe with you, Lord. I believe what your word says to me. But then the second part must be accomplished to grow in Christ. That is to obey the word that you believe. I think a lot of people fall down in that area. So let's look real quick. And it says that one of the ways we believe him, we start simply by thanking him. I thank you, Lord, and it will tenderize my heart with such simple declarations of thanksgiving that these particular truths will become part of me. You know, I don't want to get in a hurry. I want to take time to say thank you in a very slow and specific way, speaking in my heart to God. I want to ask him, secondly, to more fully reveal this particular truth to me. It's not just reading the whole chapter at once. Take it verse by verse. Read it out loud to yourself. Say, I believe this, Lord. I thank you for this truth that you're teaching me in this, and I ask you for greater revelation in my heart of this truth. Now, don't just do it one time. Be persistent. Be persistent. Stop and say, thank you. Reveal this truth to me. Then, after you feel like you've got a revelation of this word, I'm going to give you an example. One time I was meditating on, um, Lord, what was it? I think it was the woman at the well. And, you know, my name is Cindy, and, and, I, and he's always spoken to me in fairy tales. I don't know if y'all believe them or not, but Jesus likes to use anything as part of our life. So Cinderella came to me while I was meditating on the woman at the well. And the Lord revealed to me the scene from Cinderella where she's at the well and the prince has been searching all over for the, his bride and he's longing for her and he has this glass slipper and he's, he's come to the end of his journey and he can't find his bride and he's lovesick and he comes to this well and she's hiding because she doesn't want him to know that she's dirty, that she's got rags on. And she sees him from behind the corner, and she sees his tiredness. And what does she say? She says, oh, maybe I'll just give him a drink of water. He looks so tired and so thirsty. And the minute that her heart leapt in service to her prince that she was hiding from in her weakness and her dirtiness, he recognized his beloved. He took her from the muck and the mire. Oh, I'm feeling it all over again. Mm, that's he beautiful. raised her up and made her his bride and the queen of all the land. And so the Lord was saying to me, that's him. He's lovesick for his bride. And I got such a revelation that was different than all the teachings from the woman at the well. Jesus said, I thirst, give me a drink. He said, if you knew the water that I had to give, you would never thirst again. So that is praying and receiving a revelation from God. And let your imagination go. What's it going to harm if you write down some fairy tale or some wild idea? It's your personal journal. You're not taking the test. Nobody's going to come with a red marker and correct your grammar. It's going to be okay. So many people are afraid to receive from God. <clears throat> they literally think that they're not going to hear correctly, and so they don't even try. It doesn't hurt to just venture out there and write down your thoughts. And you'll know it. You'll know it when he touches you. You'll know immediately, oh, God, because he's ravished you ravished you in your weaknesses. So after you receive this wonderful truth from God, whether it's intellectually or emotionally, people are different. So don't expect to receive like everybody else. Don't compare yourself to your neighbor. Then you commit yourself to obey the word. You know, he, in that particular passage, there's a certain truth that he wants to teach you. And often we take so many truths we pile so much information into our minds that we really can't obey them all at once. And if you're like me, you have stacks and stacks and stacks of books and journals and teachings. But the ones where I sat before him in silence and meditated and prayed like a child back to him and committed to him in a simple childlike manner saying, Lord, I will obey this truth you're teaching me. Give me the power to obey you. Work this out in me, Holy Spirit. Those truths I have never forgotten. That Cinderella story I just gave you was probably given to me around 2003 or 4. And you see it's just as fresh today as it was then without any notes or journal in front of me. That is the beauty of learning from Holy Spirit rather than learning through study and head knowledge. 
though both are valuable. So when you are obeying the Lord, you say to him, I commit myself to obey the challenge you set before me. Lord, empower me by your spirit to obey this truth set before me. So these are just some teachings here about how to pray and read the Bible. It's a quick analogy, a quick teaching, a prayerful dialogue with Jesus. But we need to approach, we must approach the Song of Solomon with this attitude. Paul the Apostle said that he was a wonderful teacher. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But God forbid that at the end of his journey, he would have not learned the very lessons that he taught others. That is a sobering thought. I think of it every time I teach something. Lord, please let this be an apprenticeship between you and I. Let me learn these lessons, not just be someone who can spout them out because I, I made a list one day in prayer or I read a book and I want to share it with somebody, but it truly become the living word of God in me. That and that is the only way we become transformed. So there we are. We have how to pray, read the Bible. I think it's very valuable. So now I want to start teaching a little bit on about the Song of Solomon. There are eight specific revelations of Jesus in the song. And there are a few passages, if you want to turn with me, Isaiah 9, 6, it's very quick, you know this. The, Isaiah teaches us that there are these different names for God. Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. You know, every time the Lord gives his name in the scripture, he's giving a revelation of how he wants us to relate to him. Does he want us to relate to him as Father, Everlasting Father, or perhaps Prince of Peace, or the Mighty God with a strong right arm who will never let you down, the Warrior God? Well, this is what God does throughout the Word, and we have these examples. We also have, um, in, uh, let's see, the Revelation, we have the Seraphim and the Cherubim, and we have these faces of Jesus. We have the eagle, the calf, the lion, and the man. Well, all of these are symbolic archetypes of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And these are what we call the faces of Jesus. The Song of Solomon does the same thing. There are eight different phases, faces, excuse me, of Jesus in the Song of Solomon. And actually that would be eight different phases of our lives understanding the face of God in these manifestations. They are the counseling shepherd. Now, I'm going to go over these quickly, but when we go through in the following weeks, each one we will spend an entire uh, lesson on, so you don't have to worry. But in um, verse chapter 1, verse 8, they are the counseling shepherd, the affectionate father. The third one is the sovereign king. The fourth one, the safe savior the heavenly bridegroom, the suffering servant, the majestic God, and the consuming fire. All of these are the faces of God and Jesus Christ revealed throughout the Song of Solomon. I think it's interesting that when we look in the book of Revelation and we find the ox, the eagle, the uh, lion, and the man, in history, all of these have represented Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Have y'all heard that before? No. Well, they do. Those four creatures, if you look at ancient artwork, and it's a picture of John, the apostle, there will be the eagle there with him. It will show that he's prophetic, that he has eagle eyes. Uh, Matthew, the face of a lion. Okay, so let's look at them. The face of the ox is the wonderful counseling shepherd and the suffering servant. That's the book of Luke. It's also, as Luke is revealing Jesus, and Revelation is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not really about the revelations of prophecy. It's about revealing the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just look at that real quick. Because I think we forget that when we're studying the end times and eschatological teachings. Revelation chapter 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. So not only is it a revelation of the end time, is it personal to us today, or like the church of Laodicea, 
but it is a revelation of Jesus Christ himself. So Luke, in the book of Luke, you will find lots of passages that are suffering servant, the counseling shepherd, the wonderful God who's loving and kind to us like a servant, like the ox is a servant to its master. In Matthew, you will discover the face of the lion represents the book of Matthew. And that you will discover Jesus is a sovereign king and he's a safe savior. I love the teaching of the safe savior. Jesus is leaping upon the hills and skipping upon the mountains, the hills of torment and the mountains and the troubles in our life. He leaps over them like a deer. They're nothing to him. He just leaps upon them. And he is a safe savior that you can come to. He's safe. He's not going to hurt you. When you come to him in your trouble, Jesus is a safe place. And we learn that. We learn that in the psalm. Mark represents the face of man. And we see him as Jesus, the heavenly affectionate father, and our heavenly bridegroom. These are, our heavenly bridegroom and the Song of Solomon is kind of divided into two. He's a prophetic heart and he's a ravished heart of this heavenly bridegroom. And as I said, we're going to get into this in great detail. This is a summary of where we're headed and how the Song of Songs reveals Jesus in so many ways in these particular eight places. And then, of course, I said John, the Gospel of John. He uh, represents the eagle and is the representing the majestic God and the consuming fire. So that's just a little bit there about the faces of God that we're going to be experiencing, the type and archetype of God and his many facets. It doesn't mean we worship many gods. Let me make that clear. But God in all his wondrous variety relates to us at different seasons in our lives, sometimes as a father, a brother, sometimes as a nurturing mother. Sometimes he relates to us as bridegroom king, as lover beloved. There are so many facets of God that he takes you through in the seasons of your life. And what he's doing is he's revealing himself to you. As we behold him, we are changed from glory to glory and strength to strength in the beholding of him. And so many of us learn about him but do we know him? Are we known by him? To me, that is the great purpose of life, to know him and to make him known, to return to the first commandment. That is where we find growth. That is where we find intimacy, fulfillment, and everything that our heart is longing for. It is in the knowing of God and the being known by God. Well, let's just talk about the song generally. So it is called the Song of Solomon, and it is called the Song of Songs. The reason it's called the Song of Solomon sometimes is because Solomon wrote it. And he actually wrote over a thousand and five songs. He was a very prolific songwriter. I, we don't really think of Solomon that way. We think of him as the king of glory, the one who built the temple, the one who you know, had a problem with women and married all these wives with idols later in his life. We think of him as the great man of wisdom, he wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Psalm, but really he wrote over a thousand and five songs, it says in 1 Kings 4.32. Well, the song of all songs, it actually, in the Hebrew, it's like saying God is the highest of the heights, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We enter into the Holy of Holies. It's the way the Hebrew language would emphasize this is the best of the best. So of all the songs that have ever been written in all of history, in all of eternity, this song, I believe, is the greatest song that's ever been penned or redeemed by all the redeemed. It is the greatest prophetic song that's been given to the church age. And in the medieval times, it was extremely popular. And it's really just now in the last 20 or 30 years starting to come back in popularity. Um, as I said last week, I was Song of Solomon. I was bridegroom when bridegroom wasn't cool in the 80s. So I asked the Lord one day in my meditations, and I said, what, dear Lord, will the music be of our wedding march? And we talked about this this week, and here it is, my notes written right here at the top of this session. And he said, the song of all songs, my love. <laughs> so I think God is showing me that the Song of Songs is but the lyrics of a great symphony of worship, maybe even just 
the outline of thousands of years that we will be worshiping this song with the Lord? We don't know. We know that a lot of the songs, like the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb and, and you know, the song of Deborah, they're in the scripture. But this is recorded for all eternity to be called the song of all songs, the most important song that was ever written throughout all history, all eternity. I think that is because the Spirit of God gave Solomon a supernatural moment where he actually pinned the heart of God. And in it, he revealed Jesus. He revealed the bride. I don't actually believe that Solomon really knew what he was pinning. Like many of the prophets in the old, I'm sure that Isaiah did not know 500 years before crucifixion had even been invented that he was prophesying the crucifixion. He didn't have any understanding or paradigm of what that meant, but he crucified, you know, I, I mean, he prophesied, I, my bones are, you know, poured out like a pot shirt, you know, and they have whipped me and all kinds of things. So he was prophesying what he did not have an intellectual understanding of. And I believe that Solomon probably was that way as well. Now, the purpose of prophetic songs is what? It's to reveal the fresh heart of Jesus. What is prophecy for? And the purpose of songs is the testimony of Jesus. And in Revelation 19.10, what do we read? We read, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So why people want to throw prophecy out of the church, I don't know. Because they pretty much just said, Jesus, we don't want to hear your teaching. We don't want to hear your prophecy. We don't want to hear your testimony. I think that's blasphemy, quite frankly. Yeah. So that's my own personal little opinion <laughs> <in> there. <laughs> it says very clearly, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It includes what Jesus thinks and feels about future events. It reveals the pulsating heart of God. Have many of you heard Misty's song about what are you thinking, what are you feeling, I have to know. This is a song birthed out of her spirit and the heart of God. What are you thinking, God? What are you feeling? I've got to know. I've got to hear from you. There is no other answer that I can have. It's you and only you that can give me the answer to my life. I can hear from people. I can read books. They can give me advice. But until I hear from God, I'm not moving from this place. As Moses said, God, they can go up, but unless you go with me, I'm not going. Amen. That is the heart of somebody. It's all right to comment. That is the heart of somebody who has a revelation of the pulsating heart of God. You want to know. You, you can't live without knowing what revealing and thinking of what he's doing. You know, there's prophetic power in singing God's word and God's voice. Uh, the end time saints that we are and those that come after us, if Jesus tarries, are pictured as standing around in the book of Revelation on the sea of glass like crystal, and they're singing two songs. Let's look at it in Revelation 15, 2 and 3. It says, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast whoo, standing on the sea of glass having harps of gold and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Well, to me, the song of Moses represents the Old Testament, the song of the Lamb, the New Testament. Perhaps the angels and all the saints will gather on the glassy sea one day and we will sing the entire word of God. <laughs> that would be great. But what are we going to sing? The song of all songs, the greatest song that's ever been written, the bridal mm -hmm. march of the bride of Christ. Kiss me, O oh God! Yes. Woo! For the kisses yes. of your word. For your word is better than all there's out there. Everything better than wine, better than love, better than revelation, better than everything. Kiss me, oh God. It's a personal cry of the bride for her bridegroom. And when we stand and we sing victoriously, we defeat the enemy. Now, this is my little bit I'm adding. Look at Second Chronicles, because I've been standing on this word for, oh, 30 years it's, it's almost one of the wonderful words in my life. Second Chronicles 20. And this is about Jehoshaphat. King Jehoshaphat. 
he was uh, really worried about the enemies from Syria, and they were coming to take over him. And so, to make this a short story, he basically proclaimed a fast throughout all Judea. And so Judah gathered together to ask for help from the Lord. They had God-centered prayer. They said, O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over the kingdoms and of the nations and in your hand? Is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? They fasted and they praised. They set their eyes on the Lord. Judah, of course, meaning praise. The lion of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> and then in verse 15, a prophet comes to them. And he says, listen, all of you, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of the great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And then he tells them, position yourselves, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And later on, he comes down and he tells them exactly what to do. He says to put the worshipers out front. Those who should sing and praise the beauty of the holiness of God. They went out before the army. They went out beginning to sing and to praise him. Now, what does that remind you of? I, it reminds me of the drama and the fight in the Revolutionary War. And the little boy standing there playing his piccolo and his fife and his, the drummer and, and the flag. And they put them out front. <laughs> and they had no guns or weapons. The cannons were behind them. They risked their lives to, to sound the alarm. And that's what we do as intercessors. We sound the alarm. We go out before them all. We worship. And my favorite verse is the result of that. Verse 24. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude. And there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. What happened was they fasted. They prayed. The Lord sent them a word from a prophet. said, God is with you. Do not dismay. They put the worshipers out front in great trust and faith that God was able. He was going to do this. Fight the battle for them. And when they came up on the other side of the hill, what did they see? All of the armies of their enemies had fought against each other in confusion and killed each other. They were already dead on the other side of the hill. Already dead. That's the kind of God that I believe in. Amen. That's the power of Judah, the worshiping God and his people. So I say, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, lift up your voice. Let your song be heard out of the mount of the center of all the earth. Now, one of the beautiful things about the martyrs in the book of Revelation here was that they were martyred, but they were victorious. Amen. This reveals their undying love, which was greater than anything they loved on the earth. They were victorious in that they did not lose their love yes. in the midst of their martyrdom. Let me say that again. They were victorious because they did not lose their love in the midst of martyrdom. Everybody's going to be persecuted for their faith if you're walking Amen. in Jesus. Amen. The key is to not lose your love in the midst of the martyrdom. In the midst of your persecution, of your mocking, of your slander, and God forbid, you're shedding blood in the Amen. earth. Don't lose your love. How do you do that? One is you've got to have love before you might lose it. Mm -hmm. Where do you get love? You get that love, the oil of intimacy in the presence of his face. Oh. I said this last week, a lover will work, outwork a worker any day. I think in John 10, it talks about Jesus' sheep know his voice and hear his voice and won't follow another. The wolf comes up by the back door. The shepherd comes in the front door. You know your shepherd. You know your voice. You know who you're following because you're in love with him. You know, if you hear the voice of your lover and your beloved, your, your ear just perks up. Oh, what, what, huh? What do you want? Oh, I'm here for you, baby. But if it's some person, some solicitor that calls you on the phone, you're just going, that's a worker. Oh, hang up. You don't even give them the time of day. A lover will outwork a worker. 
every time. And God is looking for lovers. Right here on my sign behind me. God is a lover. Looking for a lover. So he fashioned me. And he tamed my heart. I love that. One of the beautiful things about the Holy Spirit. Is he doesn't just send you out into the fray alone. He gives you a fire. And empowering. Yes. He empowers us to extravagant worship. Mm. You know, our worship is mingled with the flaming fire, the very power of God himself, which inspires us to worship. He has not left us alone. He has sent us a comforter, a helper, a paraclete. He said, I am with you, but I'm going back to the Father. But don't worry, I leave another one. Woo, I feel this. I leave another one with you. You are not alone. He gives you the power that you need. Call upon him. Let the Holy Spirit rise up from within you. Let him pray out of you. Declare his word back to him. Let him love you that you might love him, that he might love you, that you might love him. It's back and forth and receiving and giving and I love you and in you and in me. God in me, God in you, that we may be one as he and the Father are one. He is an eternal God. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfect in his triune being, perfectly loving each other, not one greater than the other. He is a communal God, a God of great communion. He is not one God here talking to one God there, but he is one, and he is holy in his goodness, and he is a communal God. He's not an individualist. He is one in union and oneness, and he is calling you and me and me and you. And God says, oh, Jesus says, Father, that they may know you. As you and I are one, that they may be one as you and I are one. Oh, 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 Jesus. Oh, oh, my heart is just beating strong with the prophecy of God flowing through me right now. His spirit is crying out to his people. The most important thing on God's heart is you. Yes, God. It's you. Yes, God. It's not what Thank you have. You, it's not what you're going to do. Thank you, Father. It's you. Thank it's you, you and him and Thank he you, and you. Father. One forever eternity. Oh, this is eternal life. To know him. Mm. To know him. Yes, God. Hallelujah, Ooh. Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody help me get my cup Hallelujah. of water up here. Oh, Hallelujah. glory. Hallelujah. I hope y'all are getting that revelation. Praise God. Yes, Lord. <laughs> That's actually an ancient revelation from the saints of old. Lord. That's what they call ecstasy. Mm. That's why they were in prison. Yes, That's why Jean Dion was in prison for preaching that very mm. thing, the oneness with God. They were like, blasphemous, you can't be one with God. Same <laughs> devil that persecuted Jesus. <laughs> Does he think he is Messiah? <laughs> Just ignore them and go deep. That's my Amen. opinion. Amen. <laughs> okay, so Jesus, the Lamb of God. What is the Lamb song? Jesus, he sings over his bride the Lamb song. And the sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. I think the song of the Lamb is the song of all songs. Because he told me, that's my wedding song. That's our wedding song. Can you imagine... Oh, what was multitude, the multitude, the multitude. You know, maybe I'm simple-minded, but I'm imagining a, a church and a bride. And, and, and Jesus, the bridegroom, standing up there looking so handsome. And she comes, we come through those big ancient gates that open up and let the glory come in. Oh. Woo! And we stand in our bridal gown, all oh, white God. and washed and ready and ravished and in love. We, we want to run from that all to him. Glory. And oh my God, God I feel Jesus. a shiver running over me. Oh, Jesus, God. Jesus, God. Jesus, God. Jesus. Oh, God. we just can't wait. God. The wedding God. feast God. of the Jesus. Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. God. And we hear oh, the angels sing, kiss him, kiss him, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. Oh, when they sing the great song. At the Mormon Tabernacle Choir will have nothing on the angels of heaven. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait, Lord. I'm getting excited talking about it here. Oh, Lord, thank you that you give us fresh revelation in the midst of teaching 
And thank you, Lord, that you Bless inspire you us, you know. Bless your name. I got tickled when I went to Dallas. And I'm just going to calm down a minute because I'm about to ascend <laughs> with Jesus and leave y'all up here. So um, when I went to Dallas, my Facebook profile page has me on there with this little blue shirt. And it's the color of the Dallas Cowboys. Well, I never even thought of it. But they're all <laughs> Dallas Cowboy fans, you know. So a couple of the guys came up to me and they said, you know, you look like a Dallas cheerleader. I'm like, what? I'm 55 years old. <laughs> and I thought, that's the best compliment I've had in years. So I was laughing. It was so cute. But I was thinking of that this morning. And God says, you are a Dallas cheerleader. You're not a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader. You're a cheerleader for Dallas. You're going to encourage them in the prophetic. You're going to exhort them. You're going to bring them prophecy. And that is God's cheerleader. Amen. So I said, praise you, Lord. They looked at my picture, and that's the first thing they saw. They just didn't know what they were seeing. God is alive. He's not forgotten Texas or Louisiana. We're down here, all you people all over the earth. All right. Jesus, you make me smile. You make me laugh, Lord. Let's see, where am I? Jesus sings. I will sing praise to you. All right, how does Jesus sing? Well, one of the things he does is he sings directly to the body of Christ. He'll sing to you. Amen. And don't limit God to hymns. Please don't do that. God is famous <laughs> for taking you wherever you are in your situation. Once again, the woman at the well. Here he was, just thirsty, came upon this woman. He saw her where she was. She was drawing water. And what did he talk about? Water. Then he started prophesying to her. He's our best example of how to reach the lost. Right there. The great example. Go up to them. Look around you. What do you see? Use the object lessons around you and allow Holy Spirit to reveal through them. Yes, so dear. he sings to his people. He'll sing right to you. And I tell you, he has the best sense of humor. Honey, let me think. One time he sang to me. Glow, little glow worm, glimmer, glimmer, la, da, 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 from like the 1910s. And I thought, what in the world? <laughs> Talking about glowing. Uh, one time he sang this to me through someone else. It's a song from the Wizard of Oz. And I went, and I thought, what the heck is this, Lord? You go research it out, you look up the words, here's what those words say. Come out of the dark and into the light. Da, 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 da. And it just went on about come out of the darkness into the light. I thought, Lord, you are so funny. Another oh, time he sang to me some Motown, honey. I don't know what you like, but Jesus and I, we love Motown. <laughs> and you ever heard the song, People Get Ready? Yeah. Ooh, that's God singing, get ready here. Get ready, because here I come. I'm about to bring you a love that's true, so get ready. Get ready. That's Jesus said, I'm coming back. Get ready. I'm bringing you true love. <laughs> he can use anything. And I guess I just happen to be listening to Motown that day. So don't have a religious spirit. Now, on the other hand, while I'm on this tangent, don't go out and listen to all Amen. kinds of music just because you think, well, I can listen to what I want because God will speak through it. No, that's a fallacy. The opposite is not true. Yes, God right. can use anything, but God doesn't use everything. Amen. Thank you. Okay. There's a little fine tuning there for the body of Christ, free of charge. <laughs> In Louisiana, we call that land yap. We got just a little bit of extra for free. I wish I could hear them laughing because you know they are. <laughs> All right, so Jesus sings directly to his people. The second way Jesus sings over us is he sings the heart of God. You know, he will sing just the heart of God. It just, I don't know how, he just sings God's heart to you. He sings it in the midst of the congregation and in God's people. And, and uh, it will just be in church maybe. And, and he'll just, you know, you'll be singing a word and he'll quicken you. He sings it. But it's God using his people to communicate to you. And many times, people who are um, new in the Lord or even don't even know God can sense Him singing to them through a song. They may only understand, I feel love. What's this? What's this? I don't understand what this is. And all of a sudden, you know, I think I'll call my mama. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, that's the Holy Spirit quickening them through something that He's sung over them. 
He may sing to you in the middle of the night through a dream. He may send an angel to sing over you. You may not even be able to audibly hear it, but he's washing you with the water of his word. He doesn't slumber or sleep. And this is one of the ways he sings. The third way is prophetic songs, spontaneous songs. Uh, in the midst of the congregation, somebody who is used of God as a psalmist will often sing spontaneously by the Spirit, like prophecy, but it's a prophetic song. It's probably how the psalms were written. They were written in song, and someone was there as a scribe and recorded it down. But it was probably just David or Solomon or the chief musician sitting in David's tent before the Ark of the Covenant, worshiping with all his heart, and a scribe was there and wrote it down. Because when you're in the middle of a prophetic song, you can't really write it down. Right. You've got to record it, or it's what I call a poured out drink offering to the Lord. Many times I thought, oh, I wish we'd have recorded that. Mm -hmm. It was so awesome. But really, uh, do you remember when David was hiding in the cave, and he was longing back for Jerusalem, and he thought, hey, oh, I long for the sweet water from the wells of Jerusalem. And some of his brave men snuck out in the middle of the night and went into enemy territory just to get him a cup of water and brought it back to him. And what did he say? God forbid that I would drink this water. This was bought with sacrifice. I will pour this out unto the Lord as a poured out drink offering. And he poured it on the land. And I believe our worship, which is undocumented, the new song, in the secret place at night when no one's listening but only God and his messengers that are sent to minister to us here. We are a poured out drink offering. Because honestly, we are the, the tabernacle. Right. We are the house of God. Mm -hmm. We are the house of prayer. We can attend prayer with each other in a building. But the truth is, we are the house of prayer. Mm -hmm. And when it's you and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and all the angels, you have a majority. And then when you and I get together, two or more, Jesus is in the midst. Right. And then more come together. Not to forbid the forsake, you know, not to forsake the uh, gathering of the saints. Because it's exponential. Mm -hmm. And you can have just this fabulous celebration service where one can put a thousand to flight and two can put ten thousand to flight. And honey, we get three thousand intercessors in a room and we're going up to glory together. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I see it. If you're right with God, if you're wanting to worship Him, it exponentially lifts you up. But it doesn't mean that He doesn't hear you in the secret place. He values that poured out drink offering. Loves us. Ravishes His heart when we do that. So these are some of the ways that Jesus sings over us as He washes us. It says in Ephesians 5.26 that He might sanctify and cleanse her, the church, with the washing of the water by the word. That is such an unusual phrase, the washing of the water by the word. You know, so many people, where's my drink? So many people use that passage to beat women and husbands and wives over the head, and quite frankly, I'm tired of it. That passage is also for single people. <laughs> it's for all people of all kinds. And what Jesus is teaching us in there as the body of Christ, now I'm really stepping out there, but since I don't have anybody in here with arrows and darts and all you are my friends, and you can't hit me through Facebook, I'm fixing to preach the word as revealed to sin. It says, submit ye one to another right. as unto the Lord. That's the word. All right, let's go here. Let's just go here because now that I've opened up this can of worms, I may as well close it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I love you people. Don't get upset. I'm getting ready to set you free from all that religion. When you hear what I have to say, this is one of my rabbit trails, so just sit back and enjoy it. Don't be drunk with wine. That's for you, Diana. But okay. with, not that she drinks, but that she's holy. But Which is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, continually speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Can I get a witness? Let's yeah. sing it, honey. Let's release the dance. Let's release the arts, singing, songs, hymns. Yeah. Have fun with God and each other. Praise God. Give thanks always for all things to God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, comma, 
submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's the end of the worship, the singing, the dancing. Mm -hmm. Submit to one another. When you're in the Spirit, it's not hard to submit. But Amen. let me tell you what that word really means. Submit is such a bad translation to Jesus. me. It means prefer and defer to one another. Yes, Don't be rude. Take turns, yes. for goodness sake. How many times does Paul have to come back from the grave and teach us to take turns? If one has a song, if one has a hymn, if one has a tongue or a prophecy, mm -hmm. let two speak, let the other listen. That is the problem. That's why the prophetic gets all this trouble with being called wildfire. Well, honey, I don't want any fire that isn't wild that came straight from the throne of God personally. I don't want old fire. I want fresh, new fire, wine, fresh wine. So right here, prefer and defer one another in the fear of God. Wives, prefer your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the source or the river of life of the wife. As Christ is the source and the river of life to the church. He is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is the subject and preferring Christ, so let wives prefer their own husbands in everything. You need to go to your own man for your needs and not some other man. That's pretty simply understood. Women have a way of, and this is good to point out where we're studying the Song of Solomon and things of love and matters of the heart. Women have a way of falling into emotional adultery a lot more than they do physical adultery. That comes later. But a woman's heart will get, unless she's just all caught up in evil spirits and seducing spirits that has hardened her to the point where she can't even feel anymore, then she'll be just like a man and just want cheap sex. But a woman's heart generally has emotional adultery before she has um, physical adultery, and that's because she needs to prefer her own husband to all other men. Just as we prefer our God, Jesus Christ, to all other gods. Have no other gods before you. So preferring the source, our source, our, our oneness with God is what we should prefer. We don't need any other gods. We don't need to say, well, I think I'll try what these Islamists are teaching over here this week. They got some wisdom. No, you don't need their wisdom. Amen. You need the wisdom that comes from the throne of God. Yes. All right. So wives, prefer, prefer or defer to your husband. Now, why do we do this? Jesus says in verse 26, because he might sanctify and yes. cleanse us with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself, us, present us to himself, the glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that we should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives. He who loves her loves himself. Okay, so basically what I'm pointing out here is the washing of the water of the word is like Jesus is our source and our river of life and he washes us, we're supposed to wash each other. We're supposed to prefer each other. Our Christians are supposed to be brotherly sisters in love, kiss each other with a holy kiss. It's a holiness. It's not an ungodliness. It's not a, um, an authoritarian view of life. It is a um, mutuality of being one in the spirit of uh, deferring to your brother when he has a word to say. And when you are learning harp and bowl worship, which is what we teach in the houses of prayer, you have a scripture and then you sing it and everybody does it spontaneously. They all come up with their own phrases just right on the flies. Uh, they call it improvisation. And you've got these four singers. Well, how do you know who goes first? There's a method behind it. And one of the things we teach is prefer your friend. If you both start talking at the same time, back off. Let your friend go first. That's the Christian way. Be humble. Don't roll over somebody and force your attention and your way and your work. Can you see? It's all about the spirit. It's all about character. And this is this passage that Jesus is teaching us or Paul is teaching us. So when we sing a new song, when we sing this beautiful new song to ourselves and to others, it washes us. It's Jesus washing you with the water of his word. It is the song of all songs. He is the most awesome worshiper. He's from the line of the tribe of Judah. Woo! I love the Lord. All right. 
Now I want to finish up talking about this focus. What is the focus of the song? The unique focus. Arise, O singers of the Lord. There is a focus, not only the faces of Jesus, but the general purpose of this book is to fully capture people's hearts. It is very clear that Jesus' personality it's like a condensed revelation of his passion and affection and his personality, which includes his enjoyment and affection for weak yet sincere believers. I am beautiful to him. I fascinate him. I am his favorite. Even in my weakness, I am lovely to him. These are the central purpose of this book, is to teach you the first commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But in it, you're learning who you are in relation to Him. And you are a weak, broken person in need of redemption. And you are beautiful to Him even in your weakness. Now this is a major distinction from the body of Christ in many, um, many uh, paths. Many people teach that we are ugly, that we are sinful, and that they, they beat us over the head with repentance until we get right with God. Okay, that's worked pretty good, but it's not really gone deep. You know, we got some people, I call it fire insurance. You know, if you don't get right with God, you're going to hell. But the scripture says it's his kindness which leads to repentance. Amen. So, you know, you can, you can preach at somebody hard enough to them get convicted by the Holy Spirit, and God does use that. But I think the deeper method here is he's teaching us his heart yes. and his heart is that he came down for weak broken people that couldn't walk the walk couldn't keep the law couldn't talk couldn't do it right couldn't love each other and did it for us and it's the free gift of salvation and in that we have a revelation of how he sees us you know he loves us he's in love with us he likes us <laughs> you, know, you can love somebody and not really like them it's a revelation of the honor and the beauty of the corporate church as well as us personally. It's, we are lovely to you, Lord. You know, each one of us is a favorite. <laughs> I'm his favorite. You're his favorite. So if you meet people that study the Song of Solomon, we'll often say, I'm his favorite. And it's not, bri it's not bride pride. It is, I am his favorite. I'm sorry. And you can say the same. Amen. Individually, he loved to die just for me if I was the only mm. one. And it's that attitude of God loves me just Jesus. like I am and yet desires maturity in me. Now, here's something I want to add that I think God is doing in the end times. I think some of you have heard me say this before, and that is that in the last days, Jesus reveals himself, you know, what face of God, let's ask that question, what face of God is he going to reveal himself? Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father? Nope. Bridegroom, the conquering lover, coming back for his bride, the bridegroom king, the worshiper, the Judah. He's not coming this time as a meek lamb. He's coming as the lion, the king of Judah. So he's Lord. coming as your bridegroom. I believe that's because in oh, this revelation really? from the Song of Songs, we are getting the strength to endure the end times. Yes. This is what endures persecution. Yes. Being a lover, being loved by him, and knowing that no matter where you are, in that quiet place, in that prison cell, he's with you. Yes. He loves you. Even in your darkness, even in your times of hurt and pain and mockery, and even when you mess it up and you make a mistake, he yes. sees that yes. willing yes in your heart. God, help me. I want to do better. God, I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to hear your voice. I want to see your visions. He loves that of us. He loves that yes in our spirits. And because the revelation of true intimacy is our strength, the opposite in this case is true. The revelation of false intimacy, pornography, sexual trafficking, masturbation, everything evil that has to do with false intimacy, gay people, everybody that are living in identity crisis, all the homosexuals, all the heterosexuals, we all got problems with false intimacy. Not a human on the planet is without temptation Amen. that isn't common to man. Woo. 
Ooh, Doesn't amen. matter which person you're interested in, there's perversion on all sides. Amen. That is the false. The true intimacy is in God. Mm -hmm. That is your strength. The false intimacy right. is in the world and the evil spirits which tempt us and beat us up to we beat to the pulp and our face down in the mud. Jesus. That's why I believe that for the last days, Jesus has revealed himself as bridegroom is to counteract the false intimacy of the enemy. Yes. And maybe just the opposite's true. The enemy read the Bible. He knows Jesus is coming back for a bride. So what's he going to do to combat it? Stick us with false intimacy as hard as he can. Pervert everything. That's Tell right. us we're dark. Tell us we're unlovely. Tell us we're too sinful for a bridegroom. We've got spots and wrinkles. That's the voice of the enemy. Yes. The voice of Jesus is, come to me. Yes. All who labor and are heavy laden. Yes. And I will refresh you. For my Lord, yoke is easy Lord, and my burden Lord, is light. Lord. So I believe that this message of the Song of Solomon is essential to the body of Christ in the yes. last days. Without yes. it, we're a worker. With it, we're a lover. Yes, God. Bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. I think I'm going to end there for today. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to say that loving the Lord our God with our whole heart is different than loving him with a partial heart. Amen. The only way we can love God with our whole heart is if he comes and empowers us to do it. He first loved us that we might love him. So I want to knock off of all of us this idea that I have to be good enough to love God, that I have to do enough to love God. I want you to get the revelation of you in your weakness are lovely to him. He's ravished by that yes in your heart, by that little baby step towards him. It doesn't just delight him. It ravishes him. Yes. It's all he lives for. Union with you. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can do it. Oh, she failed. That's all right. Come on. Come on. Come on. God sees you as someone he adores, not mm -hmm. someone who's not yes. getting it right. Someone who's immature and needs him to help them mature like any loving parent would, like any spouse who loved their spouse would. Mm -hmm. A loving spouse thinks sacrificially. Jesus said, and I'll end with this, no greater love at the man than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for us. And as we lay down our lives for him, we are ravishing his heart and loving him back. Amen. Amen.